How much work did you do in the original physics to be able to write about it in your play? I have had an abiding interest in what I'd call popular science for many, many years, Robin. I can remember back in the 1990s when it was not uncommon around a barbecue uh, in a backyard for people to be engaged by an examination of, uh, you know, what was Einstein's greatest mistake? And wasn't it interesting that his greatest mistake was in fact his triumph coming up with a the idea of a constant in the universe. There was a whole bank of popular books being put out on the subject. You know, uh, I remember George Smoot, uh, Wrinkles in Time, and and here's a chap who'd uh, exposed the cosmic background radiation. In fact, come up with an image of it, and there it was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. The face of God, I think it was described as being. I have these glimpses where I think, yes, I understand this. And just as... The door opens, it closes as well at the same time. So I just have this extraordinary appreciation. And I think the best example of it, um, talking to Robert Kirshner, a great American um, astronomer and physicist, uh, who was talking about the elegance within scientific theory. And his doubts about string theory was because it didn't seem elegant enough. And so, and this was a bit of a, a window for me to be able to see an appreciation of poetry is almost similar to an appreciation of the very symbols that Peter Higgs has just been honoured. And to, just through symbols, predict the existence of a particle that is obvious to no one, that is almost unknowable, to predict its existence, to be confident in your prediction, and to have this verified in your lifetime. Twice, indeed. Twice, indeed. Paul McCartney mm. walks mm. through the door. Yeah. And then what happens as if he's a Higgs? Ah, well, it depends on who's in the room. If we assume that the room is filled with uh, Beatles fans, and uh, if they are sort of equidistant from each other, as soon as uh, Paul walks in, they gravitate towards him. Uh, I've described it in my awkward way as the Higgs boson being the charisma of space. Um, so they're attracted to him, and this slows down, gives him momentum, gives him mass, and, and so uh, it's difficult for him to get moving again to, to reach a speed because of the constant barrage of people coming around him. And as they fall away from him, they go back to their original spots, and this other clumping occurs. Well, this clumping mechanism that's created, this charisma, this attraction of mass to this state of Paul McCartneyism, is the Higgs boson. Giving uh, mass. Giving mass to yeah. the universe. Yes. Now, here you have Veer in your play. Yes. Superb mind. Yes. And then comes the cataclysm. How did you deal with that? Look, I, I happen to be doing a series called Two on the Great Divide with Tim Flannery. And we're wandering around the uh, Blue Mountains, you know, looking at the, the Great Dividing Range. And um, we had a lunch break and I went for a bit of a walk uh, at Wentworth Falls and uh, there was a gardener working on this lovely house and I, I got to talking to him while I was eating my salad roll. And he said the house had belonged to Veer Gordon Child, I think he called him, and I'd never heard of the bloke. Later on I said to Tim, have you heard of Veer Gordon Child? And he said, yes. Of he's, course he He's has. the <laughs> father of archaeology, he said. And uh, I thought, oh, well, all right, good, interesting. Anyway, later I was, I was just fiddling around uh, reading about uh, Veer Gordon Child and realised that he'd fallen to his death in the Gross Valley. And he'd fallen from the very point where Darwin had stood. Wow. And so I had these two competing things going on in my mind. There was Darwin's leap of faith, in a way, because it was at this point that he later realised the age of the Earth. He realised, standing there, prior to that he'd thought, being a, a man of God, a pastor, that there'd been two creations, a northern hemisphere creation and a southern hemisphere creation. Well, standing there looking at these tiny streams and the great gorges they had cut into the landscape made him realise the earth was a lot older than he'd thought. 
and this challenged his whole thinking and changed his whole thinking about life on the planet. So I had Darwin standing there making this leap of faith into a, a new understanding of the world. I had Gordon Child, Veer, and the name means faith, leaping from there. And then um, uh, I had cause to um, uh, look after my dad, because uh, my dad came down with Alzheimer's disease quite profoundly. So I, I began to wrestle with the idea of what happens to a mind when it is challenged by this malady. I could see Dad disappearing. Dad was winking. He was dying in his mind. Uh, so I tried to tie together these three things. Uh, the idea of religion, the idea of science, the idea of what it is to be human and what the leap of faith is all about, whether we leap towards the modern priests in our world, which are scientists, and you still have the challenge of the forces of the church. And so this play is about my Veer, who in my imagination worked with Peter Higgs in 1964, and uh, has kept an abiding interest all his life, a brilliant mind, gets Alzheimer's with Louis bodies, so he knows that he's going to lose himself in a matter of months. So he's got to reconcile firstly with his colleagues, first act. Second act, he's got to reconcile with his family. One argument, however, mm. you said faith in the scientists. Yeah. I don't have faith in scientists. Going back to your mate Darwin, he wrote a great number of things, mostly right. It's yeah. pretty good. Mm. But he, he was wrong on two things. He was wrong on the brains of women. Right. And he was wrong on blacks, if you like, negroids. Uh -huh. and once you found out, oh. as Darwin nearly did, that he was wrong, you change your view. Yeah. So mm. the last thing you want mm. is strong faith, mm. because in that way you get misled. Blind faith. Uh, leads to prejudice and leads to mistakes. My character of faith is an atheist and I've sort of always felt that the, the most difficult thing to accept for us humans really is that there is nothing else, there is no God, there is no overarching power. And if we don't accept that, then humans are bound to repeat the errors of history and the errors of the past until we make this great leap forward to accepting us ourselves for what we are and to enjoy the extraordinary wonders of the world and wonders of the universe for what they are. I mean, how disappointing is it not to be able to appreciate these things for what they are, but to imagine that, like my dad did and most of my family, that... It's a veil of tears into which we're born and it's, life is a struggle and we can't pretend to understand anything. Let's just put our faith in God. And so uh, the, the massive argument of the second act of my play is those who want to save Veer's soul by introducing him or giving him a relationship with Jesus against those who want him to maintain his dignity and go as he's always lived. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs>